One of the one of the things that I appreciate my about my mom <clears throat> is that she will send me emails that she thinks are a little fishy. You know those emails that you get from CRA or uh, Amazon or iTunes, and it says we've noticed some suspicious activity in your account, and we need you to send your username and password so that we can check it out. Um, you've you've gotten those emails, right? Um, you know they say uh, we we need you to send your password. Uh, and, I, and I think two things. One, like if you're the CRA or iTunes or whatever, you already have that information, right? And second, I think if you're going to go to the trouble of writing a phishing email, at least spell stuff right. <laughs> like I've seen an email from the CRA that spelled revenue wrong. <laughs> it's beyond me. And yet, people still fall for it. And just PSA, if you, ever, if you ever have questions about an email, like send it to me. I'll tell you if it's real or not. Um, week after week, it never fails. And it, and it never fails to amaze me that, that, that CBC will have this news report about, oh, so-and-so lost so many thousands of dollars because they gave their information to so-and-so. And then the next week, the very same story, but with a different name. And then the next week, the same thing. It just, it is, it, it's beyond me. We have to be careful about what we believe, right? We have to be careful about who we trust when it comes to emails and phone calls. And um, that's true not only of emails and phone calls, that's true of Christian teachers as well. Sadly, it's not just the secular world that has these problems of scammers. There are those in the capital C church who see faith as a way to make a buck or to gain power and influence for themselves. And so we need to be um, discerning as followers of Jesus. We need to think carefully about who we trust to teach us you know, ultimately, what are we doing here? We deny ourselves, we take up our cross, we follow Jesus. Who can we trust to help us to follow Jesus in that way? That's really um, the, the, the case that we are thinking about here today. Um, sadly, this problem is not just a modern problem. It is an ancient problem as well. In fact, even as the New Testament was being written, there were false teachers who were out there trying to influence what the church understood about Jesus. And so this idea of a false teacher is written right into our Bible. 2 Peter 2 takes this on, and so I'd invite you to turn with me to 2 Peter 2. Um, today is particularly important to have it open in front of you, um, because there's a lot of ground that we'll cover. And ultimately, we're thinking this. Um, who can we trust to help us to follow Jesus? Who do we, who do we trust um, as we walk with the Lord? Now, 2 Peter 2... Uh, 2 Peter 2, verse 1, um, Peter starts kind of in the middle of a thought in, in verse 1 there. He has just been talking about the true prophets of the Old Testament, and he says at the end of chapter 1, um, no prophet spoke from their own inter interpretation, but they were carried along um, by the Spirit of, of God. Now, he says in verse 1, but there were also false prophets among the people just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce uh, destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Peter begins by, by laying it out quite clearly for us. There is no sugarcoating it here. Um, he is not underplaying the issue. Peter wants to make it abundantly clear that we need to be aware of the possibility of false teachers creeping into the capital C church. And in the rest of this chapter, Peter um, unpacks what those false teachers are like and, and, and what to look for. Um, and, and while I could go through this one verse at a time, I think it makes more sense for me to just highlight for you three themes 
that Peter keeps coming back to. Time and again, he revisits these three ideas. So I think what I'm going to do is highlight those three ideas, show you where they are in that passage, and, and cover it that way. So there's three things that Peter wants you to know about false teachers here in, in this passage of Scripture. He wants you to know about their sin. He wants you to know about their effect or their impact. And he wants you to know about their fate. In this passage, Peter's going to tell us about the sin of false teachers, their effect, and their fate. So I want to unpack those one at a time. First, the sin of false teachers. Um, there's actually two issues here. One, what they believe, and two, what they do. Um, we've already seen the first one, verse 1. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them. This is an aspect of a false teacher, um, a false doctrine or, or bad belief. They, they think um, messed up things about <clears throat> the truths of God. False teachers have this habit of introducing um, new ideas into the Christian faith, ideas that are not rooted in, in God's word. Um, you'll recall from uh, 2 Peter 1, he says, guys, I'm not coming to you with cleverly invented stories or things that I made up. <clears throat> he says that in chapter 1, now in chapter 2, he says, there are people who will come, verse 3, in their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they have made up. They will simply make up things and say this is in the Bible, or they will overemphasize <clears throat> certain parts of the Bible in order to make a, a, a point. Um, just at the end of April, 39 bodies were dug up in Kenya, um, followers of a teacher who said, you need to starve yourself in order to get to Jesus. That day is coming, he says, prepare by starving yourself. I would love to know exactly what it was that he was saying to those people that convinced them to, 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 to trust him and to do that. Um, <laughs> Let me assure you, there is nowhere in the Bible where it says that starvation is salvation. That is a destructive heresy that this guy has introduced to the church. And, 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 and it doesn't have to be an obviously out there idea, right, um, that people bring into the church. Uh, false teachers can bring all sorts of ideas into the church. You know, saying, well, Jesus isn't really God, or um, we don't have to read the Old Testament, or we only focus on this book of the Bible, um, or uh, claiming anything, really, that goes beyond what God has written in his word. That has the potential for heresy. Uh, and so we need to be careful about what our teachers um, believe. So that's, that's one aspect of the sin of false teachers. The second is what they do. This, I think, is nicely summarized in verse 10. They follow the corrupt desire of the sinful nature. These guys claim that they've been saved by the grace of God and delivered from the corruption of the world, and yet, what do they do? Verse 19, they're slaves of depravity, having been mastered by their sinful nature. Right? Their sin may not be what they believe. Their theology might be great, <laughs> but their actions are not. Peter lays it out. Look, verse 3, you've got greed. Hmm? Verse 14, they're experts in greed. They're in it for the money. Now, the old joke at this point is, um, who would get into ministry for money? <laughs> uh, but um, not fishing for a raise. Um, <laughs> In, in, in some circles, you can make so much money in the church. Like, about five years ago, there was, a, there was a bit of a stir. There was this televangelist who wanted his people to give money so that he'd have a $54 million jet. Um, because if Jesus, quote, if Jesus was around today, he would not be riding a donkey. <laughs> That's what he said. He would be riding a jet so he can get around the world to spread the gospel. So he needs you to give money towards his $54 million jet, his fourth $54 million jet. False teachers can be experts in, in greed. Um, verse 10, you've got arrogance and pride. 
right? These people who are in it for themselves, for their own brand, for um, their own platform, rather than building Jesus. They're sort of using Jesus as the teeter-totter to put themselves up into the air. Um, verse 13, verse 14, verse 18, you've got people who are in it for pleasure and adultery. 14, they never stop sinning, they seduce the unstable. Verse 18, they mouth empty, boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the sinful nature, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. In, in error. This, I think, is one of the most tragic and, and, and awful things about false teachers. They abuse the power and the influence that they have for their own pleasure, taking advantage of the people that they're supposed to take care of. Verse 19, they promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity, for a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. And there are, are too many teachers who give in to that. Um, that, that's the sin of false teachers. Uh, in some cases, what they believe. In some cases, what they do. Uh, their effect is all too real. Verse 2. Many will follow their shameful ways and bring the way of truth into disrepute. Right? No wonder people think ill of the church when half the biggest names in Christianity have sex scandals in their Wikipedia page. Like... Verse 18, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. Christian leaders are supposed to help people, to, to help people to walk in this straight and narrow road of godliness that God has given us everything we need to live. And yet there are some people who say, you know what, don't worry about that. It's okay to, I don't even want to go into it. Their effect is that they fool faithful believers and they put the name of Jesus into disrepute. That's what Christians are like. I'm not following Jesus. That's their effect. Um, <laughs> what about their fate? Well, Peter keeps coming back and back to that. Uh, verse 1. They are bringing swift destruction on themselves. Three, their condemnation has been long hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping. By implication, it's about to pounce. Verse 13, they will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Verse 17, these men are like springs without water, i.e. they are useless, and mists driven by a storm, completely inconsequential. Blackest darkness is reserved for them. They think they've got it figured all out. They think that they are living the life, and yet Peter says they're going to get theirs. Their fate is sealed, and it is not pleasant. God holds his teachers to a higher account. So those are the main ideas that Peter wants us to know. Their sin, what they believe and what they do. Their effect, how they fool believers and bring um, shame upon the church. Uh, and their fate. Swift condemnation and destruction. Now, what do we do with this information? Um, I want to be really careful here because calling somebody a false teacher is a big thing to throw around. And you just don't go around calling out people and saying that they are a heretic willy-nilly. Um, frankly, I think that some of the people that make videos about other people calling them um, false teachers uh, really just have good orthodox theology that doesn't agree with the idiosyncrasies of the person who's making that video. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's tricky, um, but I do think it's important to be discerning in who we listen to as believers, because we live in a, in a time and age when anyone with a microphone and an internet connection can, cr can grow up a huge um, following and spread ideas and get them into the mainstream. And I know that, you know, when people aren't here, they'll watch other uh, teachers on television or um, even just in addition to uh, Sundays, they'll watch people on TV. Um, when you do that, be discerning. Um, in the interest of helping you with that, I would say be careful with any of the health and wealth kind of teachers who would say, pray with enough faith and God will make you rich. And you should tithe to the church. <laughs> Um, be careful with anybody, any sort of Christian nationalist people 
who associate loyalty to the nation with loyalty to the Lord, be careful there. Um, be careful with anybody who wants you to put anything before following Jesus the way that the Bible talks about following Jesus. Um, this is why knowing your Bible is so important. right? This way you can test their teachings and say, does this line up with what God has said in his word to it? Because it's ultimately the authority for me, for you, for the world, for the church. Um, and, and, and even further to that, does what this person is saying line up with the whole of Scripture, right? You might be able to leverage one verse to make a point that sounds really compelling, but if you fit that within the whole um, flow of Scripture, does it still make sense? And, and, and to be completely honest, um, I think that in our day and age, the false teachers that we need to be careful about aren't even in the church. You know, as I was writing this sermon this week, I think there's nobody, there's nobody who's going to fall for this. Like if I said to you, give me money for a $54 million jet, you guys would go, yeah, right. <laughs> what about a $54 million tractor? Would you go for that? <laughs> Where's Kent? There's Kent. <laughs> Get a Ford. <laughs> um, not a Ford, a John Deere. Uh, clearly, I'm not a green guy. You guys could pick out a false teacher a mile away, right? But are we just as discerning when it comes to the voices and influences outside of the church as we are within? right? Um, secular leaders can be just as guilty as leading us astray. I mean, if they are not, if they're not following Jesus, then they have already broken the one thing that Peter points out the very first. They have denied the authority of Jesus, right? They have denied the sovereign Lord who bought them, Peter says in verse 1. So we need to be careful about the influence that we allow those people to have in our lives too. You know, it could be influencers, it could be authors, um, it can be political movements. We need to be just as careful about those teachings as we do about the teachings that happen within the church. So... If that's, so, d discernment is important. If that's who not to trust and who not to follow, right? If discernment has led you to say, I don't think that this person is actually leading me along a faithful walk with Jesus. Um, who do we trust? Um, Peter doesn't actually say anything about that here in, in chapter 2. He says, beware of false prophets, but not trust trustworthy ones. Um, so I think to really fill, in and fill, it, fill out and flesh out the rest of this message, we have to say, um, follow the leaders whose teaching in life show that they are following Jesus. Right? Follow the leaders who are following Jesus. Let me unpack that um, just really quick here. Follow the leaders whose teaching shows that they are following Jesus. Um, yes, be discerning. Yes, hold everything up to scripture to test it. Um, and if you've got a leader that, um, if you have a leader whose teaching is, is, is on par, not on par with Jesus, nobody's on par with Jesus. If, if, if someone is teaching you in a way that lines up with Jesus' own teaching and the teachings of scripture, follow that person. Right? Allow them to have an impact in your life, in the way that you shape uh, your faith and your, your, your worldview. Um, I am I'm constantly making sure or trying to make sure that, that my doctrine is on point. Um, you won't believe the arguments that I get into in my head where I go like this far into a doctrinal um, uh, idea just to make sure that my doctrine's clear. And then about a half an hour later, I have to go, wait, my people really only need me to get this deep <laughs> into this doctrine. But I am so aware of wanting to be sure that I am faithfully teaching you. And I'll tell you, one of the, one of the, one of the sort of key aspects or key questions that I'm always asking myself is if Jesus was sitting back in that corner, would he agree with what I'm saying? Every sermon, every sermon I'm asking myself that. 
if you have um, teachers whose uh, who, who's, who's teaching is biblically faithful, it's, it's theologically faithful, um, then they are worth listening to. Let them influence and shape uh, your faith and your life. Um, follow the leaders whose teaching shows that they are a follower of Jesus, but also follow the people who practice what they preach. <laughs> right? follow, the, follow the leaders whose life shows that they are following Jesus. If you've got somebody who says one thing and does the other, then you've got a problem on your hands, right? You need someone who will walk the walk and talk the talk. Um, this is what is so frustrating when you hear about preachers who are great preachers, who are great teachers, and then it turns out that they've been embezzling money or having some sort of affair on the side. Um, you know, whenever I get up here on a Sunday morning, I need to make sure that the scripture that I'm telling you about has already done its work in my heart so that you're not just hearing me teach the Bible, you're hearing me teach how the Bible has taught me <laughs> this, this week. Look for people who's, look, look for people whose inner life um, is reflected in, in what they do. You want people who, of integrity whose teaching is reflected in, in their actions. Um, Doug Moo, one of the people that I read this week, says, when we are faced with the teaching we're not sure about, we have a hard time judging it against scripture, um, look carefully at the lifestyle of that person um, and that will prove helpful. Do they teach with humility and, the, and love? Do they give evidence of seeking to submit all their conduct to the Lord Jesus? Um, do they pray with fervor and sincerity? These are the kind of questions that scripture encourages us to ask of those people who, who teach us. So follow the leaders whose teaching and life show that they are following Jesus. And, and if I may, I'll take it one step further and say this. Follow the leaders who lead you to Jesus. Right? Ultimately, I think that the people that Peter describes here in chapter 2, um, the one thing that they have in common is they're in it for themselves. Consciously or not, they are using the church as a way to gain power or influence or money or pleasure. And yet, what does Jesus say to every believer? Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow him. Not, not Graham Gladstone, not the next internet sensation. My goal is to lead you to Jesus, and I hope that you feel that I am doing that, because that's, that's my goal. It is absolutely crucial for us to follow the leaders who lead us to Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for including this in, in your word. Um, you have not left us to be unaware about these things. Um, you have taught us to be discerning, to, to, to take every idea and test it, to bring it into the Lordship of Jesus and say, is this true? Is this accurate? Lord, we would be sheep who follow not a sheep in wolf's clothing or a false shepherd. We would follow you, the good shepherd, you who laid down your life for, for us, for your sheep. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to, to be discerning. We pray that you will help us to have wisdom and insight as we listen to other teachers or are exposed to other ideas in the world of Christian faith. And not only that, in the secular world, too. Lord, as we, as we hear about any number of things and theories out in the world, we pray that we would bring that same discernment and, and godly wisdom to it to say, does this accurately line up with the worldview that God has presented in his word? Help us in that, Holy Spirit. We, we see only from this moment, and yet you see from the point of view of eternity. So help us to see with, with your eyes and, and Lord, I pray that you would help us um, to not be, trans not be conformed any longer to the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind such that we would be able to know and accomplish your good and perfect and pleasing will. Jesus, make us more like you. Lead us to you every day. We pray in your name. Amen.